Though we move along now to the helmet of salvation. So, we're learning that we're to put on the whole armour of God if we're going to be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. We need this armour to be able to engage in spiritual warfare. The difference is this armour is to remain on at all times and never to be removed. So when we look at the helmet, and Paul's using this metaphor of armour, this Roman armour, and when he looks at the helmet, you know, the helmet that the Romans wore was a helmet that was made of either bronze or iron. It had a chin strap which made it unique from all other helmets of the time, which kept it secure on the soldiers as they went into battle. It had a visor that used to cover the back and the sides of the neck to protect it should any darts get past the shields. They had cheek pieces for the sides of their face. This helmet was for protection. The main organ that this helmet protected was the brain. So that the brain wasn't susceptible to these fiery darts, these arrows that would come within the battle. So he says, put on this helmet of salvation. One thing Satan loves to attack us with is the fact of our salvation. And he likes to question our salvation. I wonder how much knowledge we as believers have obtained when it comes to salvation. So that when the devil comes with his deceptive lies concerning our salvation, it will be able to stand and stand with confidence against the devil when he comes and attacks our very salvation. You see, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, only put on their helmets when they went into battle. On their uniform they had a little ring where they would hang their helmets at any other time. So they only wore their helmets when they went into battle. Whereas Paul here says it to us, we must take up the whole armour of God so that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done so to be able to stand. And he says, put on this helmet of salvation. We are to keep it on. Not like the Roman soldiers. We're to keep it on at all times. We are in constant spiritual warfare. Satan is relentless in his evil ones. They are relentless. They are about undermining and bringing about the destruction of our faith. They want to destroy the very salvation which is at the core of our faith. It is the core belief that gives us a hope, a future. So 
So why are we surprised that Satan should come and undermine this crucial doctrine that we hold so dear? We have to keep this armour on at all times. Peter warned us that we have an adversary who lurks like a roaring lion waiting to devour. To devour. To totally destroy. Did not Jesus tell us that? That Satan has come to rob kill and destroy. So how much knowledge of God do we have when it comes to salvation? Because it's our knowledge of God and His Word that ensures us that Jesus is what? Truth. He is the belt of truth. John 14, 6. Jesus is our breastplate of righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. Jesus is the preparation of the gospel of peace in our life. Colossians 3.15 Jesus is the one who cements our justifying faith. Romans 3.20-26 and Jesus is our victorious, assured salvation. Please turn to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. He is our victorious, assured salvation. What do I mean by that? Let's look at what King David says in his praise to the Lord in an explanation for the victory through the assured salvation that we have obtained in Christ. David says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Do you hear that? Whom shall I fear? When we have a victorious, assured salvation, and make the Lord our salvation, <coughs> we should have no fear of anyone or anything. Because the Lord is the strength of my life. He is my strength. Even in my weaknesses, he gives me strength. When I stumble, He gives me the ability to get back up again because He is my strength. This is why when the archangel Michael contested over the body of Moses, he said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you. the Lord is my strength. The Lord gives the very angels of heaven their strength. Michael 
told you that. And he said, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. We have that same ability. The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, he's talking about that roaring lion. My enemies, my foes, listen. They stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, and this I will be confident, says David. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Who is that rock? Jesus is that rock. And it is on that rock that the church is built. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I'll offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle, I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? You know, Satan always begins his attack with what a Christian does or doesn't know in respect. In this case, concerning salvation. How assured are you of your salvation? If you were to take your last breath right now, are you totally confident that you will be with God forever? Yeah. Or is that their little seed of doubt? So this helmet of salvation that Paul is talking about is the assurance of salvation. He's saying, put on the assurance of salvation. In other words, in your mind, guard this. That when God saves a soul, God saves a soul. And no one can take that soul away from God. It is God's possession. And if you are born again, if you have truly repented of your sin and asked God's forgiveness and are walking in a way that is pleasing to God. In other words, walking a walk of humility. If you're doing that, and in your mind, you know 
with all your heart that Jesus died for your sins once and for all. And because of that, you're going to receive eternal life. If you have that impregnated in your mind, and you are guarding that assurance, that you have eternal life and Jesus has prepared a place for you, for you personally. So that where he is, you may be also. If you are guarding that, when Satan comes, you will be able to stand. And no matter what lie he brings to try and undermine that assurance, you will hold firm. You will not waver. You will not buckle. You will not question your salvation. You will stand firm and you will say, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Be gone with your lies. I stand in the truth of my Saviour, that he died for me and has now prepared a place for me so that where he is, I will be also for eternity. You see, truth combats lies. We need to have a knowledge and an understanding of salvation that salvation is purely a work of God. That man cannot achieve salvation through any form of self-effort. Having said all this, and everything I have just said, and that even that salvation is a free gift of God, and that we have an assured salvation, this does not license the believer to sin. Please turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Assured salvation does not license us to sin. We love to take scriptures such as Romans 8.1. And we love to read from the NIV version because it says, Therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Full stop. It does pick it up in verses 5, 6, etc. <coughs> concerning how you should walk. But in the original text, it says, therefore now there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. You see, we can't say that we love God and continue in sin. Yet many teach today a very Gnostic gospel where they separate our carnal being from our spiritual life. You can't do that. You see, when you're born again, you're born again. Your mind is renewed, and if your mind is renewed, it's refreshed, it's revitalized, it's regenerated. It's now born again of above. It now does the things that are righteous before God and walks away from the things that were unrighteous in their lives. We make conscious decisions. We have a free will. We need to do that. So because we have an assured salvation, it doesn't mean we have a license to continue in our sin. Ephesians 4, Paul puts it beautifully here. As he writes to the church of Ephesus, verses 17, I'll pick it up there. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you should, listen, no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding dark and being alienated from the light of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness 
to work all on cleanness with greediness. But you have not learned, not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, listen, that you have put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be, listen, renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away the lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, for we are members of one another. Be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labour, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Wow, that's a big one. I hear Christians with filthy mouths all the time. Yet you know one thing that happened to me when I was born again was I stopped it. I stopped the filth that came out of my mouth. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth for what is good, for necessary edification that may impart grace to the you. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour, and evil speaking be put away with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, listen, be imitators of God as dear children. So assured salvation does not license the believer to sin. You see, the areas of trickery and schemes, these wiles of the devil that Satan brings is to cause confusion. One thing he loves to do is cause confusion. He is, Satan, the author of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. So if anyone has confusion concerning their salvation, the devil is getting a hold of you. You are allowing the devil to come in and cause doubt and insecurity. He's causing you to remove your helmet and put it on the side of your uniform. So what areas of trickery does he come with? He comes with lies like, you are so unworthy, why would God save you? You're too far gone. You're too sinful for forgiveness. Your sins are too great. Have you ever heard those words? Have those words gone through your mind? They've gone through mine. Paul saw himself as the chiefest of sinners and even listed his sins. You're too great a sinner to be forgiven. You're too unworthy. You know, we need to know scripture. We need to be like Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness to be able to combat the devil with the word of God. You see, he will twist the word of God when he comes to lie to you. You need to be able to come back at him with the word of God. That is one of your greatest tools, which we will look at next week. Please turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, chapter 1. And I just want to read from verse 12. This is Paul. 
writing to Timothy, and he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although, listen, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. Pretty simple, isn't it? This was a murderer. A user. A blasphemer. But listen to what he said. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and a worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You hear that? Of whom I am to cheat. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen! He came to save sinners. And there's no sin too great. Paul was a persecutor, a blasphemer, an insolent man. He was the chiefest of sinners. But Christ came to save him. So when Satan comes with that lie that your sin is too great for salvation, don't listen to the lie. Just say, yes, I am the chiefest of sinners, but Christ came and died for my sin. And because he died for my sin, I have victory, not just over you, but over death, and I will live eternally. So when the devil comes and reminds you of your past, just remind him of his future. What a way to combat him! Eh? <laughs> we always question, I don't know how many people that are supposedly born again question their salvation. Am I really saved? That saddens me when people ask me that question or they're questioning their salvation. Because the problem is, when Satan comes with his trickery and causes confusion to the believer concerning their salvation, suddenly that believer can start to get caught up in works. Because suddenly, because of the fear they have concerning their salvation, they start to do things to try and appease God. To prove to God that they're saved through their works. And they forget, salvation is a free gift of God. It cannot be obtained through any form of works. We cannot appease God because our righteousness is like filthy rags before God. The Lord becomes my righteousness. He imputed his righteousness to me because of the faith that I have placed in him. You see, we need 
need to be assured and not confused. Please turn to the Gospel of John. John 10, this beautiful passage. John 10, 22. Let's start there. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem that was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple on Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. Listen, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and listen, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Did you hear that? They shall never perish. Don't let the devil bring confusion and lies into your life. Don't let him bring you to a point of questioning your salvation. You will never perish. Neither, listen, shall anyone snatch them out of my hand, says Jesus. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Do you believe that? Do you believe it? Do you really believe that? That when Satan comes with all his lies, you will stand confidently in that. Yep. Because you believe that. I'm stressing that word, believe. Oh, and then we have the hyper-Calvinistic lie that he loves to come with. He loves to use theology. You are not of the elect. God created you for hell, not heaven, because you just keep on sinning. You may laugh, but it's true. Please turn to Mark. As I said, you need to combat these lies with scripture. Mark chapter 2. Okay. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the thatched office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose, followed him. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, the many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when Jesus, and when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, listen, but sinners to repentance. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes, we continue to fall to sin because of our hearts that are wickedly sick. But it's Jesus who came for us. That's the Lord who is the light in my salvation. Yes, I fight the sin in my life. I have overcome much of the sin in my life, but there is still sin 
to overcome. And I know the Lord who is my life and my salvation and he is my strength will help me overcome what I have to face in the day. Our testimony when responding to Satan is not found in ourselves. It's not found in ourselves, but in Christ Jesus and what he established and fulfilled on my behalf. I could talk about this for a long time. I really could. I could preach all day. I could do it in Israel. But I know that people can't stand for that long anymore. You can't stand me for that long. <laughs> so in conclusion, the helmet of salvation The knowledge which springs from God, confident assurance of salvation. This is an assurance that strengthens the mind when the lies and doubts, sown of the evil one, come. This is an assurance that when faced with adversity, even in times of overwhelming odds like Moses was. When Pharaoh chased him and he stood before a sea and was cornered, said these words, Stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. And you see, Pharaoh and his army is a picture of Satan and his army. Moses is a picture of a man who stood in the strength of the Lord. And you know what he did? He held up his rod and and led them all to safety. And what happened to Pharaoh and his armies? They were cr crushed beneath the waves in that sea as they pursued God's people. The Lord, my salvation. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. You know, one man said concerning this passage on the helmet of salvation, if we go around wondering or hoping that we're saved, we're not going to be very effective in the battle. But if we know we're going to heaven, no matter what, that frees us up to focus on other things and focus on the task at hand. Good words, aren't they? So in closing, put on the helmet of salvation and keep it on. Hold on to the secure words of Jesus concerning our salvation used earlier within the sermon from John 10. 27 to 29. So that when the enemy comes with his deceptive lies sowing doubt and confusion, you will stand in the salvation of the Lord, assured what he has said will come to pass. That is what hope is. Hope is the blessed assurance that what God has said will come to pass, and it will come to pass. Every single word that he has said and he has promised you that he has gone and prepared a place for you so that where he is you may be also because you have put your total faith in him and not in yourself for salvation. That should excite you. 
There's power in the salvation that the Lord has given us. Satan hates the very word salvation. Especially when a Christian stands in their salvation. For the Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I be? Amen. 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 And the Lord bless his word this day. So we're going to close. song